first of all, I apologise I'm not on the virtual machine for this. I was having a bit of difficulty, which is it's probably completely me being um, um, silly rather than it anything being um, anything not working or not being clear. But there we go. Okay, so so, so um, say, just, just wanting you 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 would like maybe to maximize the browser f11 uh oh yes of course ah. and maybe if you can uh increase the font uh font size a little bit uh, I, I i don't know how to use jupiter but i think it should be easier to increase the size uh i don't, I don't know if that's I'm possible probably, probably right i'm just uh oh, it's not the one um I mean, I've got one option that I was. Oh, that's a bit better, isn't it? Yeah. See, really good. Yeah. Excellent. Yay. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry for the. Uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. Setup issues. There. Actually, one thing I should just check before. So, I've got, I believe, so I've got an hour and a half. So I've got now about. 30, is it 35 minutes? Uh, no, because it's. Uh, are you? Are we going through your lab as well? Uh, because you didn't manage to record it, I, and I think uh, you have to go through everything at once, right? Oh, that's fine. I'm happy to go through my lab as well. In which case, I've probably got yeah. absolutely loads of time, which is which is fine. And, and then later we may uh, split the presentation for the lab or something like that, because we are recording this presentation as well. Oh, of course. So if, if at any point you want to say stop and we'll do, we'll start. Yeah, so let, let me give you exactly the time frame, considering that uh, you are also presenting to GAP. So you have up to, give me one second, uh, 5.15. So you have oh, one hour and seven minutes. Oh, excellent. I've got plenty of time then. So yeah, uh, yeah everyone settle in because we'll be... Doing quite a lot of, uh, we'll be looking at quite a lot of code, but hopefully. Uh, but, but now it's the practical part, so it's it's easier. It is, yeah. And actually, I've got, I, I've said there's a separate walkthrough in lab tutorial. Really, they're, they're similar in that I'll be walking through, um, you know, use of the code. But um, what I'm hoping is that you might see something that you think, um, you know, I, I want to do a bit, I want to try that out a bit more using the library and, um, hopefully, I've, I've made it so that you can just, um, whether or not in the in the notebook environment, you might prefer to do it in a Python script, but just copy the code there and, and um, go away and get started. But um, yeah, excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, brilliant. So, um, so as I mentioned on the slides, I'm going to be um, walking through um, three of these NCAS um, CF tools. Um, um, it's all the time I've got here. Now I'm doing the lab tutorial kind of joint on. It's it's not relevant how long we're going to take. Um, um, so a lot of this detail I've already mentioned in the slide. More just for if someone was going to use this um, um, this notebook standalone. So I'm just going to skip that really because I've mentioned this already. Um, but one thing quickly to say is that. Um, so my slides are focusing on on use of the tools with NetCDF, but actually CF Python can recognize other formats. So so CDL format of NetCDF and also some um, MetOffice proprietary um, formats. Um, so PP and UM fields files, if you've heard of those. Um, and CF plot can also just take pure NumPy arrays um, as input. So uh, the tools can work with other formats, but NetCDF is really the um, the key uh, audience um, in a sense. Okay, so for this particular notebook, um, in terms of learning objectives, so I've kind of split this up into four different things just to so show some different um, capability. And um, I'm going to try not to spend too long on each one. I'm going to try and show different things just to chop and change and make it a bit more interesting. Um, so just to quickly go over what I'm going to hope to show. Um, so first of all, just to begin with the basics, really. So I've mentioned that field constructs are the central object in, in CFDM and CF Python. Um, so I'm going to show you how you can go from a NetCDF data set or multiple ones to, to field constructs um, and how you can go back, actually. So you can I've mentioned you can write out 
field constructs to to NetCDF. You can write out your own NetCDF data sets um, with whatever you want in them. I'll show you how you can do that. Um, then we're going to just I'll show you some very basic data analysis capability, um, some statistical collapses, some subspacing. Um, this is really particularly for for that section. That's only the very very basics of what can be done. Um, I'm going to try not to um, throw in the deep end, more just get you familiar with the, with the library. But I do encourage you to explore the documentation for for these tools because um, there's a lot of guidance in there on the the different possibilities, um, which go uh, far beyond you know this this basic kind of uh, walkthrough. Um, so thirdly, regridding. I think I mentioned this a few times. So um, so if you have um, data defined on, say, some sort of, of grid, i.e. a domain on the um, on the globe, then you can change that grid while preserving the qualities of the data that you had originally. And hopefully some, some of the plots I'll show will illustrate what I mean by that, um, if, if, if that description doesn't really... Um, um the kind of indicate that um but you might you might have heard of regridding as interpolation that's a, another word for it um i'm gonna i'm gonna show that across uh, both spherical and cartesian yep. coordinate systems Here's oh, Julia. can i just can i just interrupt you for a second so there have oh, been sure. a couple of requests how did it works uh, in the vm to get it started um, um ah, i see Okay, so I, I can um, either go. I'm not sure if you changed anything because you said, Luciana said that you had an issue that it didn't work somehow for you inside the VM or so. Um, yes, I mean, I've. Because it um, works for me. It's a virtual environment. Screen. I'll just try and check what the comments are and then I can. Uh... Yeah, well, the comments was about how do we get it working in the VM basically, and I started to give some help, but. Yeah, sure. Maybe maybe I should um, help with this first, actually, because if, if people want to follow along, I was thinking this would be more, my original intention was this be half an hour of me trying to show what to do. But yeah, if people want to follow along, that's definitely probably um, good. So uh, I'm just trying to get a feel for the comments of what the, uh, do, so do you have the notebooks on the VM? Okay, so um, I think in terms of to, to get them, I have updated them since um, I think Julian had set up the VM. So if you've got Git set up, you can use, uh, you can just do a Git pull. Um, but if you don't have Git set up, um, I, I think probably the easiest way is if, I'm just, I'm still sharing my screen on it. Let me try and get to. Well, we, we, do, we do have Git, so they not only need to have Git pull done. Oh, is Git pull all, all that's needed? Okay, well, I'll, no, I'll just... Yeah, yeah, let, it's a little bit more. Let a, can I, I, I suppose, um, uh, yeah, maybe it's best if I just show it, maybe. Is that okay for you, Sadi, if I just hijack it for a second? Oh, no, that's fine by me. I was going to I was gonna try and show it myself, but if you... Yeah, certainly, Julie, I mean, if you want to... Except if you do it inside your VM, that's fine, but you should do it from the VM. That's what I mean, right? That they have the same picture and they understand what's going on. No, that's yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, up to you, right? I mean, you, I, I just oh, I, I guess it's now I'm sharing my screen. I can go on the VM. I see what you mean. I'm sorry. I, I, I guess all the confusion earlier with me trying to get the audio set up has made me forget basic basic things. Okay, so I can get my um, yeah, let me get my virtual box up. That's perfect. Thank you. I will mute yeah, now. Yeah, sorry. I. I, I I see clearly what you mean now, and it's it's definitely the best solution. Okay. Um, um, oh, oh, it's already running. Yeah, I was wondering why it was saying show and not start. Right. So I um, hopefully in in your VM. Um, possibly you have the same as, as me. Okay, maybe I'll start it. Um, sort of the key keyboard's gone a bit wrong, so it's hard to get to 
my home space. Yeah, my keyboard is very out of sync. Um, so hopefully in your VM, you'll, you'll have um, a directory called CF Training Master or CF Training or something similar. Um, so hopefully you all know where the repo is. But as I've said, it's not fully up to date. Um, actually, this one I've pulled down um, not via Git, just because I um, wasn't sure if I had the, the data in, in the right place. Um, so yeah, a Git pull is certainly the quickest way to do it. I haven't set up my Git on here, so I can't do that myself. And what I was going to suggest is that... Um, Wait, uh, um, so if you go to um, study, right? If you go to input output, just go back to the home directory. Um, yeah, sorry, like yeah. my keyboard's messed yes. up after that instead of a tilde. <laughs> and here you go to input dash output, and then there is, just go there. Ah. Good. And there you do source oh, start, start as H. Um, sorry, so, I must have. I must have assumed no, it wasn't no, just, there because of the... Just please, please do also a source start as H because it loads the virtual env that I put everything in for you. Mm -hmm. um, so source ben, ben. It's one in the, in the one in the top. So you have to go to the parent directory. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yes, from here, I just... Source start as H. Yes, that's good. Now you can go into this directory and you know, CF training exactly oh, to do a git pull. Uh, I'm really sorry I missed that. I um uh, in in the chaos and trying to sort out the sort my audio. I yeah, I've obviously missed some some basic things. Okay. Um, Can you just increase the, the font a little bit again? Oh yes. Um, sure. <laughs> I can work out how to add a new new tab, isn't it? Um, it's Control plus plus or something. Yeah. Control plus plus. Um, yeah, so sorry for these. Um, oh, my key, my keyboards. Uh, oh, what's that one? Yeah, you just changed the keyboard. Julian left the VM with the keyboard in Germany. In Germany. Oh, yeah. yeah well, I thought I sorted well, out the, the German. Um, the top letters. right, there should be. There should yeah, be. Yeah, I have the top the icon to just change to to English. But it's it's great. This this sauce now. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so. You think it should should work? Oh, yeah. Oh, lovely, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's why I prepared it that way. All you need to do, you have to Perfect. delete those files. Just to lead, delete those files, um, RM them, and then um, you can do the pull. Oh, excellent. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, so let me just yeah. If there's any comments about anyone saying that they're they've fallen behind and they missed a missed a step or or anything, please let me know because I'll. Obviously, sharing my screen, it's I can't really keep an eye on the comments at the same time. But um, excellent. Oh, that's much better. Thank you. Um, right. Now we uh, can do the git pull. Completed. Oh, yeah. Because I was about to say, I haven't still seem to have pulled what I was hoping to have, have <laughs> got from the repo. Um, ah, lovely. OK. So yeah, we've got some new things up there. So I've just done a git pull to get the current state of, of the repo. Um, and in particular, we're going to be looking at this this short course here. Um, so just to say in terms of um, further work, um, because I'm not going to be touching the full course. I'm not going to be looking at that at all in the next you know, hour or so that I've got left for, for the kind of joint walkthrough lab. Um, but the full course contains um, what is what we do is a, a one day course um, of, of training. Um, that we that we hold quite regularly and uh, all that material is is self-contained so it should be self-explanatory and the readme here which you can see if you look at the repo on, on github um that has some instructions to help you get set up and on on good ordering to follow but the full course has um extensive materials here with the short course i'm trying to summarize things in a way that's um um I guess not going into too much detail on certain topics to keep things interesting and to try and show uh, um, various different things that, that the tools can do without focusing too much on one thing. Um, so the short course is much condensed and that's what we're going to be looking at today. So if you change into that directory. Um, oh, not, oh, sorry, I've listed it there. 
Um, sorry, in my confusion, I've got two things here because I renamed one of them. So if we just ignore the one hour summary because I had a rejig on, had a rethink on timings. Um, at this point, um, I'll ask people to open up Jupyter so we can view the notebooks. Um, so this is the command Jupyter uh, with a Y and then notebook. Uh, I, I just use an and so that um, I can open it in the background. Uh, but that way we can access all of these notebooks at once. Um, so that's what I'm going to run now. Um, and so it takes us to a browser. Um, so kind of similar to what I was showing you um, outside of the virtual machine, but um, but it's great. Now we're now we're actually in the virtual machine, which is great. So I can um, yeah, if there's any problems, I can try and <laughs> fight a fight those as we go. Um, so this is going to be the lab tutorial, which I'll show you after. And it might be that we only get part way through that, but um, it's designed to be um, something that you can work through yourself and um, um, as, a, as a place to continue on with, with what I've been kind of walking through here. But I'm going to look at this demo in under an hour. And hopefully it is in, in under an hour because I haven't got too much time left. But um, um, so this is the notebook I was looking at outside of the VM before. Um, and I think, yeah, I just got to basically discussing what we're going to be looking at. So I guess without further ado, um, or maybe maybe I'll just quickly say, I think the learning objective I just got to summarizing is uh, the final thing we'll, we'll look at um, is manipulating hierarchical groups. So um, for, your, for your net CDF for data model, um, you can have groups. Uh, you can have an entirely flat structure, um, you know, essentially with with just one group. But um, you can have a whole complicated group structure. Um, so I'm just going to show some basic um, uh, a basic example of working with with those groups with CF Python. Um, okay, so yeah, without further ado. I'm just going to do some setup first. So this is just for the notebook itself. So if you were working in a Python script, um, you wouldn't um, need to do anything like this. And it might, that might matplotlib thing might fail anyway. Um, uh, but that's just to set the notebook up. And this is actually something I'm going to do is, is a shell command. If you use a, an exclamation mark in, um, in IPython, it can actually execute shell command. That's just to basically prevent me from having to go um, backwards and forwards with this notebook and a terminal. Because um, in a few times, I want to um, usually list something out or use a, um, an NC dump command just to do some inspection and compare it with the inspection that you can do uh, with CF Python. So, so first things first is, in terms of this repo, we have a whole collection of, of sample data sets. Um, and I just want to show you what there is to work with there, because we'll be looking at some of those as part of the uh, the work walkthrough and tutorial, um, but only a small um, selection. Um, there's loads of different sample data sets to play about with. Um, it'd be more interesting to, if you, you want to explore these tools further, to you know use them on your own data sets. But if you want something that's easy to access, then they are those there. Um, actually, I'm just thinking, looks like. Has this been executed? Yes. Yeah, so this has all been executed before, actually. So I'm just going to, you might want to restart clear the output so we can actually run through it without it all being, um, have, have all have been run through before and kind of ruining, ruining the surprise in a sense. Um, there we go. So now I can execute things um, fresh. Um, so pretend you didn't see what, what was just kind of given away there. Um, so yeah, so what we're doing here is just listing. We've got this directory of all the data, the sample data sets um, in the current directory. So we're just going to list what what is there. Um, and as you'll see, there is one PP file. Just ignore that. Um, I think maybe I was just trying to showcase. Uh, oh, that's part of our full course where we do show use of other tools, not on NetCDF, but lots of different um, data sets there. Some of them are quite cryptically named, so we might look at some of those and try and work out what they are. You know, TA, C could be anything, but um, one thing I'm going to highlight is um, inspection. So actually, um, 
your data set not being a black box, but actually, you know, you can prod it and um, in any number of ways to work out exactly what is in there. Um, yeah, so one thing to just highlight immediately is some of those data sets are a classic NetCDF and some are a NetCDF4. Um, so this is an NC dump command with a minus K option, which basically just shows you the, uh, the data model of NetCDF. Um, so you see data one, another critically named file, uh, which we'll, we'll look at at some point here, possibly. Um, that's NetCDF4 and then Net, uh, data two is classic. Um, so there's a selection there. Um, okay, so first things first, how do you import these modules? And the first thing to note, um, CFDM is, is as it said, but CF Python, as I've been referring to in Python, we just, um, the module name, the package name is just CF. So you don't put CF Python, you just put CF. And in fact, I don't think you can have a module with a, with a hyphen, with a, with a dash in anyway. Um, CF plot is CF plot, but actually throughout the documentation of CF plot and, and generally we tend to use CFP. It's like with, with NumPy, often you'd say import NumPy as MP. You wouldn't, you know, you, why use more letters than you have to really? So, so let's start by importing the modules. And they've imported, which is a relief. So the environment is probably okay. Um, and this should work. <laughs> um, so yeah, just to, to begin with, like I said, the basics um, from SCDF to a field construct and then back. Um, so here we're taking one of the dates, data sets that we, we know is in our current directory above. Um, so this is the first, I guess, key function of, of CF Python read. So that is reading in a data set. Um, now in the lab tutorial, um, you might see that actually, or well, we should see that you could read in multiple data sets at one time, but usually, um, well, I'll say usually, possibly you'd be more interested in just reading in one. So let's go with UA, which again has a cryptic name, so it could be anything, but we'll read it in. Um, and first of all, once you've read in your file, it's not going to, you know, it, it's, it, the call has been successful, so it's, it's read it in. But what you really want to do is actually know what you're working with. And one thing to highlight is that CF Python provides multiple different ways to multiple different levels of detail for which you can inspect a field. So, um, um, yeah, so first of all, when you're reading a file, there may, there may be multiple field constructs that, um, that get created. So depending on what your data set is or whether you're, you're reading in multiple ones, um, you might have one or you might have any number. So when you read something in, it always gets read in as a field list. Um, just add that. So let me just show you. So this is the field here. This bit is the whole field contained in this field list object. Um, and it's a Pythonic list. It actually subclasses a list in Python. Um, but it's just essentially a list that we use to contain fields. Now you can see there's only one field in this list. So we're gonna take that out of its list container. Um, and we're gonna inspect it to see what's there. I mean, you can see when you print out the, fit, the field list, you essentially get, get a feel for what it is. Um, and if you call an object um, to get the, the representation of it, you will get this minimal detail um, view on what it is. So you can see you're being told it's a field, i.e. a field construct. Um, you're getting told the name of the data and its dimensions as well, and its units. So you get some basic information. But if you wanted more detail, um, you can call print on this object, um, which um, I think in Python makes a call to, to the str method uh, instead. And this is going to provide more details. So um, scroll up so you can compare. So instead of just uh, this one liner, you're getting more detail on um, various things. You, you, you're getting the variable name, the, uh, the NetCDF variable name, um, and you're getting all sorts of detail about the metadata. Um, finally, if you want maximal detail, so if you uh, at least in the metadata sense. So there's other inspection you can do on the data 
then we have this dump method. Um, so similar in, in nature to you know nets, uh, an NC dump on the command line, but this is in Python. Uh, so as you can see, it's giving so much detail that uh, the notebook is just trying to truncate. Um, and let me just slightly scroll up so you can compare. So uh, I'm assuming you see, I think you can see my cursor here if I kind of circle things. Um, so it's the same field, but you're getting a lot more detail here and you're getting a global attribute as well as um, um, for example there, as well as detail about, uh, even more detail about these metadata constructs. Um, there. Okay, so I guess it's a first introduction to manipulation of fields. I just wanted to show you, um, well, just an example of what can be done. So uh, in, in a Pythonic sense, you have a field, but um, the field, um, when you apply arithmetic, it's, it's to the data, um, although you can, um, there's various methods we have to uh, manipulate the metadata, but say if you wanted to take the, the data of a field and, and square it, um, uh, you could just do this. Um, so that's worked, but you you know probably thinking, oh well, what's it done? Um, and this is what I'm trying to emphasize: that there's so many different methods you can use to inspect things. Um, so let's look at the data first, because like I've said, this should square it. So um so you have the array which is, is truncated um by default although there's, there's methods to inspect the full array um and you can see the original field um has this data the squared field has then squared that uh, numerically and also important to note um so you've got a, a sense for that here actually but just to show you with in terms of the inspection on units, you can ask for the units on their own. Um, the units have changed, and they we didn't ask them to change um, explicitly. We never said change the units, but that's all done under the hood by by um, CF Python. And this is um, starting to show some of the benefits of the CF conventions. Really, it's that the metadata isn't just um, tagged on; it's fundamental. And when you're squaring that field. Um, CF Python knows, okay, the units are going to, you know, need to be squared as well. Um, so this, I had to look this up, it's a gray, I think, unit. So it's basically meter squared second um, to the minus two. So, you know, that unit squared, but in a, uh, whatever the, the fancy term for that is. Um, but not only are the, the units processed, there are other things. So, for example, you squared that field, but... Um, CF Python knows that when you square a field, it's not really, you know, you're changing the fundamental nature of the data. So what it's actually done, uh, I mentioned this standard name, essentially the definitive name for what the data is describing. Um, you get an error here. So actually the, I should, have, I should have mentioned before I did this, that was a deliberate, deliberate error. Uh, oh, this will fail. I've got it there. Um, so the field has this standard name, Eastern Wind, which you might have noticed before. But the squared field no longer has a standard name. That's why it's errant because that attribute is gone. So when you did the squaring, um, CF Python knew to strip that name off because it was no longer applicable. Now the good news is that's not you know we haven't lost a name forever. We can apply that back. Um, and actually, I was looking at the CF convention standard names table. So this is long table of um, thousands of, of names long for these definitive. Um, names for geo geocyclic quantities. But there is actually one for the square of the of eastern wind. Um, might be slightly unusual in that you know there shouldn't be one for like the the um, you know the, if you take a quadru uh, what's the word for a square of square. Yeah, you know the cube. Sorry, so I think it's a cube. Yeah, if you took the cube. That wouldn't be a standard name. So I'm not sure what's what's happening there. Maybe it's not quite what I think it is. But yeah, so you can reassign the name. Um, in this case, square of Eastern, Eastwood Wind is probably roughly what, what would be um, correct. Uh, although some experts on CF conventions might might know more than me that that's maybe not applicable. But anyway, so just by setting the attribute there, you can set this one. Um, so let me just run that. 
And now when we run the same thing we run before, you see we have the standard names. So we've now reassigned a standard name to, to this one after it was stripped off by, by the operation of, of, of giving it a square. Uh, so now it has an appropriate name. Um, so that field, which I, I've called squared field, just, you know, something that makes it easy to, uh, an intuitive kind of variable name. Um, yeah, the, uh, I guess the main reason I've created a different field is I want to demonstrate now writing out to NetCDF. So we've read it in NetCDF and we've, well, uh, under the hood, C of Python's converted it to an appropriate field construct, this central object, but um, we can now just write it straight back out. Well, right, uh, well, I say it, it's something different straight back out. Um, I could have just wrote the original field back in, that'd be a bit boring, wouldn't it? So just demonstrate some more. Um, so the write uh, function of CF is another key one. So I mentioned read back at the start. It's how you read it in. Write is how you write it out um, quite naturally. And there's various, well, there's absolutely loads of options you can provide to it. But just to show the very basic function here, provide no, no arguments, we're just going to write this to, and this is the name of the file that gets written out to wherever you are in the current current directory. You can specify a path and it'll get written there. But if I'm not, if I'm just putting a file name, it's just going to get written straight to my, my current directory. Um, yeah, excellent. So just to, to show that that's been done, again, this exclamation mark just means we're running a, a command like we would in the terminal, but within a notebook. Um, uh, yeah, so you get squared ewind uh, is there. And just to, to prove that it's not just you know, a blank file or something, that it has actually written out what we would hope. Um, so I'm going to use an NC dump. I could, of course, as I've I could uh, read this back in and inspect it using CF Python, but just to show using a, a kind of a verified tool that you, you know you can trust, um, um, just to prove that CF Python's doing what it should, I'll do it. Do an NC dump. Um, <laughs> I, had, I had trouble looking for this before. Actually, I should maybe know a bit more about NC dump to work out how to to get to certain information quickly. But just to show that it has uh, the standard name that we assigned to it. Um, there's a standard name there that's on, on the time um, uh, dimensions. That's not the one we're looking for. But ah, here we are. So UA, which is the name of, of I think the variable there, um, it's contained in square of eastward winds. So you can see that we've written out a file with that standard name that we assigned. Uh, I'm sure we can look at the data as well. I think I put a, I put a minus H. I gave some option to basically just say, don't show us all the data because, you know, it's an awful lot of information. Um, yeah, so that's basically, that's my first section, basically to show the basics of reading in some, some net CDF, CF Python converting it to field con constructs or fields for short, as, as I'll, I'll call them um, going forward. Um, and that you can, um, you can modify da data and metadata, um, but that, um, CF Python will use the metadata to work out what's sensible um, so that you don't have to manually convert units or, or whatever. When you're, when you're doing operations, the metadata will be accounted for. Um, and then, yeah, so we, we wrote that out to an NetCDF file. Um, so reading in and writing out its core functionality and CFDM, uh, something I should emphasize, CFDM can do that as well because that's um, kind of the bare bones functionality. Um, CF Python adds, um, as I mentioned, the, the data analysis capability on top of that. So what we're going to see in the next few sections, CFDM couldn't do some of the things we're going to see next. Um, so it could it could do this, and we could have used um, instead of let me just quickly scroll instead of CF write, there is an equivalent CFDM write, which would do the same thing. It would just um, write out the file. That cf dot write is is um, just a thin wrap of cfdm write, um, but yeah, what we're going to see next in terms of um, various things with with data analysis, um, this will be cf only, and I've used cf mainly just to so we're not chopping and changing between the two libraries, um, but you could do a cfdm read as well. Those methods are there in cfdm uh, standalone. Uh, okay, so some data analysis now, so just very basic stuff. Um, so I'm going to choose another data set. Um, if you're 
eagle eye you might have noticed there's a an index on here so as i mentioned when you read something in it always comes in as a field list but you might want to take out a specific field so often you'll see um uh in the in the documentation or in the so the lab tutorial reading in a field immediately taking some index um to say i want a specific field um so let me run that so this is on another cryptically named field Q qbo so let's see what what that actually is um okay so we have again we have eastern wind um so i think maybe i should have used a more diverse one but actually the, i guess the, the difference this time uh, i'll not scroll back up but if you if you just kind of i'll, I'll just if i remind you something you might have noticed or if you didn't um so this um field has um so it has the four dimensions but with the previous field uh i believe two of them were of size one leaving only um two dimensions that were um well greater than size one um so uh, imagine imagine this you, you essentially got um four different dimensions with with numerous points so you need you know 4d space to to plot all of that which is obviously not gonna um it's not something us humans could really um envision so what really you want to do with this data and certainly if you want to kind of derive meaningful uh results and um statistics from it is to reduce it down in some way um so i'm gonna show you two core ways to do that um again just the, the real basics um so the first one is a collapsed um so this is where you want to take some sort of statistic um to reduce down one of uh, the axes so in this case let's go for t which is uh, the kind of cf python shorthand for for the time coordinate um you'll see a bit later on like here x uh maps to uh lo longitude or possibly latitude i get the two mixed up but one of the two one of the two i will check later on um so in this case let's just take a maximum this is a an example of what you can take you'll see later i'm going to do a mean um actually i might try and get the documentation up just to give you a sample of um some of the many different collapses you can do this will just take me literally 10 20 seconds So there's a whole table here of things you can do. We just can take the maximum as, a, as an example, but you can take various different statistics, you know, averages, ranges, variances, um, um, you know, sums, integrals, various different things you can do. But so as an example here, we're going to do um, a collapse on the maximum. Uh, so ultimately, a maximum in time, a temporal maximum. Uh, okay, so again, that's worked, but really you want to inspect what's actually happened um, instead of just treating it as a black box that's done something that you that you want. Um, so let's just compare what we had before. So looking at the dimensions here, and in terms of the way that CF Python displays this, you've got your dimension, then you've got the number of of points, um, uh, the main points there, and you can see by comparing these two. You have to move your eyes backwards just a little bit but you see that time has gone from having um, a size of, of 398 to to just one size so it has collapsed all those time points down taking the maximum um, across the time values um, but another possibility is, is a subspace which is essentially just saying instead of collapsing it based on some um, say statistical average or um, um some um operation this is just saying i want a certain uh, a certain point there's actually taking a certain point from from the data set so instead of considering all 398 of those time values and performing some calculation 
some operation based on them to, to reduce things down. It just takes a point. Um, and in this case, well, actually, in this case, well, the next example is on, um, it's on, yeah, an X dimension, so slightly different. But say with time, you could have, you could have taken, um, you could have said, I just want this time here. I just want the first time. Um, possibly in a second we'll, oh yeah, in a second we'll show a way to just grab a time. Um, but in this case, with a subspace, and I'll show you an example, it's subspace on X. Um, and this was relative to B, so this was actually to the one above, I just, just compare between the two here. Um, Oh, hang on a second. My, that's a, that's B. Oh, I just want, oh no, because I'm printing the wrong thing. That's why I was slightly confused there. I've changed, just for anyone who's following along, I've changed that to B sub because it was printing out something that I was getting confused because it, it didn't look like it should. Um, so if you, instead of printing B as you'd already printed, you print B sub, which is the subspace we've taken um, of B, which is above, you'll see that um, now we've also collapsed down uh, longitude, so which corresponds to, to our X dimension. So that's now been collapsed down to one. But unlike with our, our, our well, I say collapse, maybe I shouldn't use that. Um, let's just say reduce, sorry, because collapse as I mentioned before, has a, a meaning in terms of a statistical collapse, whereas what we're doing here is a subspace. We're just taking one point. And th in this case, we're taking the um, 30 degree uh, lap point. Um, oh, so a X maybe is corresponding to lap. Sorry, I always get confused between the two, so I'm sure people know. Um, I will look it up afterwards. <laughs> But yeah, so you can see now that we've gone from ultimately at the start having all four of our dimensions not being of size one through a collapse and a subspace to having just two of them um, not being scalar in a sense or so not being uh, singular. And that's the kind of thing we can plot now because we have, um, you know, I have to think of this, this 4D space. So let's give it a go. And this, I think, it's, yeah, this is the first demonstration of, of us using CF plot. I think I wrote the lab tutorial first, so I, um, it's hard to remember which examples I've got where. But uh, oh, okay, that's very small. I yeah, I didn't think that would happen here. Um, just trying to think why it's why is it so small. Um, Uh, OK, well, I'm going to just um, make it more readable via, well, still not readable because of the background, but I think this has something to do with matplotlib. If you're, you're running this in a script, you shouldn't get a really tiny plot. If you do, um, maybe that's a bug, so I might have to look into that. But the other plot shouldn't be small. I just, there was something about these that I thought might be just some thing to do with my environment. But anyway. Um, so you can see, well, you probably can't see. Let me read the, the axes out here. So uh, the, um, I'll call it the horizontal axis, not confused between. So we've been talking about X and Y um, here. So horizontally, we've got latitude here. That's going from zero to, to 30, 30 north. And um, vertical axis, we've got pressure uh, in millibars. So that's just, I'll just quickly go back plotting the data that we we um, knew we had here, the pressure against the latitude, because the other axes, uh, so the other dimensions are now size one. So they're effectively um, scalars that describe what metadata we have. So, um, you know, so it's at um, this time, this singular time, it's at this singular longitude. Um, so there, there is your graph, and I'm sorry it's so small. At some point, the graphs will get normal sized again. I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, and just as an example, I'll plot another subspace. So here we were plotting x equals 30. Um, 
But if we take another sp subspace of our original B, which is the one up here, uh, let's go with zero, the, the other option for, for lat. Um, and another really small graph. Um, I can show you via these tabs. You see that, you see, I want to blow them up here, uh, that the data is different um, for these two subspaces that we've taken. Um, and these contour plots, uh, if you can't see the uh, the color bar scale, the contour plots do have some, some laboring there. Now, I'll not dwell on this because we've got some nicer graphs, but um, that's this is essentially an, an example of having taken a data set with four dimensions that um, were, were non-singular um, non and having reduced it down. Um, so here's an example of another collapse. Uh, this is on our original field A. So this is essentially going back to the first field we read in with all that, um, all those points before it was reduced at all. And we're just going to perform another statistical collapse and get, get something slightly different. And the plots take slightly longer because obviously they are. Uh, Oh, that wasn't a plot. No, that's, that's slightly longer because it's it's done and I'm waiting on nothing. Um, let's just see what we've got in this case. Um, so we've collapsed over the, the x-axis. This time we've taken a mean. Um, if I'll just show you in the um, documentation again, this table of various different things you can collapse to. So we've tried maximum. We've tried mean somewhere in this table, but there's you know there's loads of options. Um, this on the x-axis and you can see that uh, we now have a scalar dimension for for longitude um, because we collapsed on on x um, and again we can plot but well, we can't we can't well we could plot that in 3d we can't plot that in 2d yet um, i think cf plot i don't think it has 3d capability uh, the, the python libraries certainly that do but in terms of um plotting yes yeah, so we want to get things down to 2d if we want to get a plot um so we need to reduce one more thing down if we want to plot something um we don't have to reduce the field itself we can just um plot some operation on the field um, um if we wanted you know you don't have to touch the field um but in this case let's take a subspace over time um, now, time is a bit more difficult to work with because obviously date time objects are more complicated than just um, plain um, floats or, or integers that you have. Um, in CF, it, an easy way to work with it is um, DT, which stands for date time. So this is a type of CF object that you can use. And it's quite easy in that under a date time, you can just quote um, the exact form is printed of, of the date you want. So in this case, let's say, let's say with my subspace, I wanted to take that time point um, and I wanted the data just for that time point, throw away the rest of them in order to reduce that, the number of um, time points down to one. And then again, we can, pressure, uh, we can plot pressure versus longitude. Um, so let's perform that subspace. Oh, Ooh, okay, something funky has happened. Um, okay, debugging in action, although I can't get a comment sign, which is not good. Um, yeah, this keyboard seems to be fine, and it's, I don't know if something's happened now. Okay, I'm just going to cut, cut and paste that, it all fails. Let me just check, so was it the subspace? Yeah, okay, it was the subspace that's done something weird. Um, debugging in action. Have I got the date right yet? That's sensible. What's the... Okay, there's something I can't immediately tell what that is. Um, it might be environment related bug that I already know about. But let's just drop that one because I don't want to. I don't want to spend time just kind of trying to work through some um some problem while well, i could be showing you other things so um let's just assume that's something that um i will 
fix if it is an issue or just something to do with the environment. And actually, CF units, there were a few environment issues relating to CF units. There were a few versions that weren't, um, well, they had some bugs or what we consider to be bugs. So maybe that's the thing. So let's, let's move on because um, I'm probably, yeah, time is probably is uh, chugging on. So, okay, regridding. Let's move on to that. Um, um, so I kind of discussed maybe what regridding is. Um, I guess the main thing to start with is that when referred to a grid, uh, I think it's quite common in, in geoscience to just call it a grid, um, the, the terminology here is domain. So we're talking about the domain, if you remember from my slides. Um, so regridding is re well, redomaining doesn't really make sense. It's changing the domain. So you're going from one domain to another. And when I show you some plots, and they'll be nice, normal size plots, hopefully, um, that should make it clear what's happening. So let's take another data set from our sample. Again, we're taking an index because the read gives you a field list. And even if there's only one field, it's still in a list. So you want to unpack it from its list container. Um, I'm going to print so we can see what we've got. Um, so this is a precipitation field, judging by its name. Uh, there might be a standard name we could attach to that um, at some point, but yeah, that's uh, uh, not the topic here, I guess. Um, um, so in this case, we're going to read in a, another field. I'm going to call this one G, just because, you know, F, G, H, continuing on the alphabet. Um, now, this is another precipitation field. The thing to notice for this example is... These are both precipitation fields, both for the same dimensions. You've got time, uh, lat long. Um, but these have different number of points um, for, for the lat and long, a uh, different number of lat and long points. So the domains are, are different. So you have 145 lat points for this uh, field, 73 for that field. Um, and again, you have. Um, maybe you know roughly half of the field uh, of the points for longitude in G is you do on F. So essentially what you're looking at here is um, precipitation data on both. But in this case, uh, it's more um, finely grained in this case. Oh, hang on. No, in this case, it's more finely grained. Yeah, so it's more coarsely grained in this case because you have less points. Yeah, more points in this case. So there, therefore, I might imagine it on the on the um, on the Earth's surface. You have more data points, and therefore, it's going to be more finely grained here. Um, so, with regridding, what we can do is we can say, take my data from this data set, but actually plot it on the same grid, the same domain as we have um, for this data set. Now, as I'll as I've got in the, in the lab tutorial, you can also just construct a domain from scratch. So you can create a custom one, and there's means to do that in CF Python. Um, and you can use, you know, NumPy, say, to create the domain you want. But often it's just easier. If you already have a data set that has the grid you want, you can just take it. Um, uh, well, I say take it. It's not going to take it from that field. You don't have to touch that field, but you can um, use the same domain. You can say I want that domain from that that, um, that field. Um, so here's the example. So the key method here is regrid S. And it, it kind of looks like plural regrids. But as I'll show you next, you can also do regrid C, um, which is a, cart uh, a regridding on a Cartesian coordinate system. So the S isn't a plural. It's, it stands for spherical. Um, I'll let you know that now to see it to help you get familiar with the, the two two methods there. Um, in this case, I'm using H as just the next uh, letter in the alphabet. Um, but the thing about regridding is um, there's different methods you can use, different interpolation methods. So um, imagine taking data from one grid to another. It's There's not a definitive, um, there, there aren't definitive values for what it should be. It all depends on a method you use, because you can't just um, um, apart from in some very specific cases, you can't directly map data onto a new grid. It's um, it's an estimate in a sense based on some methodology. 
So here's two ones. So there's um, and our documentation covers um, the different methods and why you might want to use one over the other. But just as an example, we've got patch recovery or patch as we call it and the conservative method. And I'm going to show both of these regriddings and then just so we can compare the different output just to so I can demonstrate that you do, there are differences in, in the results produced by these. Um, OK, so let me just pre perform the regridding. And actually, after this, I've put um, a call to a method called equals. This is testing for equality on fields. Um, so you can actually, um, instead of, say, having to inspect them, you know, do, uh, performing a um, calling print around one and then manually eyeballing it to see what differences there might be. We have this method so you can check if one field equals another. I'm just typing this in here because as a trivial demonstration, I'll show that H1 equals H1 is true. That field is equal to itself. Uh, OK, so this, oh, oh dear. So this means this is a dependency that really we need to do regridding. Um, is there any way I can quickly get that now? Because we can't we can't regrid without uh, without that. Anyone? Am I okay to? If we've got a virtual env, I can hopefully. If I'm allowed to touch the virtual env, or well, maybe you don't want me to do that. Um, do you know what? Maybe what I can do in this case, just to save us, because there's not too much time left. Um, I think I pushed to our repo the notebooks that have been completed. So I'm going to show you what we get instead of running it. Sorry, so it's not as uh, um, satisfying to actually, as, as actually running the notebook and seeing what comes out. But just in the interests of time, not faffing about with things. Um, is this the right notebook? Yep, it's the one. So hopefully, I'll just be able to do a kind of Blue Peter style. This is the one I made earlier. Oh, here we go. Okay, great. Um, um, yes, so if you recall, we were up to this bit where I was um, doing the actual regrid method. So unfortunately, we, we use um, a tool called ESMF. Um, so we kind of wrap that. It's a, uh, I think a C library or Fortran library that does all the, the regridding logic. We just provide an interface to use that in Python. So without that dependency, we can't do that. But um, here we have it here. So what I was going to show you is, um, you do the, both the regridding um, and you check is that field the, the one regridded by the path by the patch method equal to the one regridded by the conservative method. Um, it's it's saying no. Um, you can add verbosity to the to the equals method call to get information about why they're different, and I think I demonstrate that later on. But um, I'll not dwell on it too much here because I'll probably show you it. So these methods produce different results. Is the is the takeaway message? Um, yeah. And now let's inspect what we have. Um, and in this case, we're going to do some plotting because that's the best way. To, um, be able to see at a glance the differences. Um, so I said take take some subspaces first because looking back at the data, um, uh, maybe it's this one. Yeah. So this one has um, twelve time points as well as multiple lat long points. So um, you want to reduce it down a bit further so we can plot a two D plot. Um, in this case, taking a subspace, taking a, um, a view at a particular point in time. Oh, no, in this case, we're, we're not taking any particular point. We're just taking the first item. So we're just taking the first um, the first time point, I believe, via the index 0. So you just index it as well as actually specifying I want a point with a certain thing. That'd be a quicker way to grab the first. Let's just take the first via index. So you subspace via index and via metadata. There's various different options, um, but we're taking a subspace here just so that we can plot the difference at that subspace in both of these. Um, so this is a kind of 
a bit more advanced use of, of CF plot. In this case, what doing is a G open and then a G close, which is essentially where we're creating canvas and we're calling G pos um, and these being just indices to say, put it in this position because we created two columns. So you can um, create a kind of grid of plots with CF uh, plot. But the main thing is here we're plotting um, I think is this first? Yes. So first of all, I'm just plotting the original field. Um, just, and con is the possibly I mentioned before the the way to call a contour plot with CF plot. Um, I put titles to try and describe what I'm I'm plotting here, so you don't have to kind of um, well you can't you can't later, but you don't have to right now kind of try and interpret what's here. This should be quite self-explanatory. We've got the field before regridding. This is a plot of the field when it was regridded with the patch recovery method. Um, and then I haven't explicitly shown the other regridding, which is the conservative method. What I've done, this is probably the most interesting one, um, is to compare the results from different regridding methods. I've actually done some more um, arithmetic on the fields. So if you remember this the example towards the start, I'd actually taken the, um, I'd squared the field by just doing field times field, uh, square the data there. So if you want to subtract the data, you can do that as well. You know, you can do any um, sensible kind of operations on the data. Um, you times all the data by zero and just have nothing in, in, in your data array, um, for example. So in this case, we're taking the difference to work out how to, to essentially plot on, on a grid the, um, the variation in these two regriddings. Um, We've just got lines here because you can have the contour lines that you might have seen in the other plots, but we can hide those and block fill will give you the actual, um, well, as the name suggests, filled blocks of what the data values are. So you can see, first of all, from the field um, before regridding and after regridding. Um, so the first domain, as I said, was more fine grained, the second domain less fine grained. And you can see that domains have changed because this one's more um kind of granulated uh, but you can also see that the quality of the data so the actual um kind of pattern in the data that you know that um um kind of the trend in the data is preserved it's just on a different domain um and yes too so just quickly go over again so this is um a plot of the difference between so if I plotted, you know, the, the regridding with the conservative method, it would have been a similar looking plot on a different domain with similar qualities, but there are slight differences. So this is the difference plot. Um, so it shows you that, um, I'm not great at picking out, I guess, patterns here, but you know, this, um, oh, color board help. Yeah, there are variations, small variations in the regridding um, that was done by by those two methods. Um, so pick your method carefully. It's probably a takeaway message. Um, yes, excellent. Um, again, is this? Yeah, I'm just saying this is a regridding method, so I'll probably have to go by here because I can't actually plot can't actually plot anything because we don't have that e ESMF dependency. It's my fault for not having highlighted to, to get that one so i'm going to keep going from this notebook but once we get onto section four i'll move back to the to the actual notebook we have here um, and run things as we go um here we are um okay so i mentioned before there's, there's regrid s for regridding cross spherical coordinate systems this one is regridding cross cartesian uh, regrid c is the name of the method which we'll get to in a bit um so I'll put some kind of preamble here. I think I was going to remove it because I was meant to talk through all this rather than I appreciate you probably want to um, pick out the code rather than, you know, read loads of writing. Um, so feel free to ignore this. I'll try and explain this as I go along. We're going to read in another field. Uh, I'm just going to use I, J, K to, to denote them. Um, obviously, it's good practice in Python to use descriptive names, but more just to um, not be too wordy and and keep the data in, in and the metadata in focus. I've just gone with some short names, but these are more data sets that we have in NCAST data. So read in one, 
read in another. They're both precipitation fields again. Um, but again, if you look, we have no different numbers of points. In this case, it's on the time uh, axis. So there's 10 points in this field, 120 in, in this one. Um, I think to say about regridding, or, um, so changing the domain is a grid um, brings to mind, you know, like a t 2D grid or a 3D mesh or something. But um, a grid can really just be, you know, it can be 1D as well. It could be different points. So here we're going to look at an actual what we have here, which is a time series um, and regridding that. So essentially resampling in one dimension. And um, again, feel free to ignore the, the text. I'm going to try and talk through this. So here is our regrid C method. Um, so we're taking the first field we, we brought in with with um, more data points or less. Let me just check. Oh, the first one had less this time. Um, and we're going to regrid it onto the domain of J. Um, so to remember when you're using these methods, your field here is the source. Um, and your field that is the argument is, is the destination domain. Um, uh, in this case, we're providing an axis because, um, oh, did we provide an axis before? Let me just check. Um, yeah, so before we didn't need to provide an axis. Um, but in this case, we do. And I'll, let me just check the fields to clarify why that is. Um, I was thinking about it, we might not need the axes. But you can specify certain axes to regrid against. Um, maybe is, is the, the, the emphasis there. In this case, we'll use a different method. We'll use linear. So this is um, linear interpol interpolation. Um, and we're doing this in one dimension. So it's just one, one dimensional um, linear interpolation. Um, so we'll run that if we um, had the, the dependency again. I'm just going to go through this in the, in the notebook um, and do a print to inspect what we have after that regridding. Um, in this case, a, a kind of uh, inspection, a wordy inspection isn't too helpful, really. So um, it's best if we go to look at the plots, it might be more um, interesting, really, because um, Ultimately, what we have here is we have the data of I on the domain on the grid of J in what we're now calling this new field called K. By the way, you can do these operations in place. We have an in place method um, to lots of lots of these methods um, that you can do. I think NumPy has similar. So instead of actually saying K equals I, or, uh, um, actually possibly a bad example because regrid might not have the in place operation. But in methods you do on fields, you can often say in play in just do this on the field of its original name, say of I, don't create a whole new variable, just do this to I in place. Um, so here are our results. <clears throat> Again, I put titles to try and indicate what's going on. Um, so you don't have to inspect and remember all the, the things I've called these variables. But our original time series field um, look like this just precipitation against um, some time in years um, and after regridding we have this now um, on a previous example we went from more uh, finely grained to more coarsely grained in this case we're going the other way around obviously we're, we're on a um, time series here so you know one dimensional thing it's different in, in a number of ways, but um, this is another way. It's kind of the opposite thing here. Um, and you can see the points have been uh, regridded or I think 1D to me, to me, at least it feels better. It feels more appropriate to say kind of resampled, but um, yeah, you can see um, again that the shape of the data, the trend, the, the kind of the quality of it is the same, but uh, the domain, the sampling is different. Um, and not completely in a trivial, trivial way either, because if you notice that the 
um, the points where there's kind of changes of inflection actually sometimes some of the data can be um, a bit changed there it's not just we take more points and everything's exactly the same so it's quite interesting um, right excellent Hi hierarchical groups next um, and which is good because I can go back to uh, the notebook um, because regridding required that dependency but that's that's all we have that dependency for so hopefully things are good now um, and apologies it was my fault for not flagging that that, that was needed um, I just find my place <clears throat> um yes possibly that should be labeled four rather than three maybe i think so yeah but anyway um next section um so as i covered in my slides and as luciana had um covered in quite in quite a lot of detail there's um different data models and in cdf4 you can have these hierarchical groups um so just to briefly show uh, oh, that's sorry. That text should be above. I'll just delete that. Just to briefly so, show. Uh, just let me interrupt you a little bit. Oh no, so, fine. Officially, officially, the time for the the lab it's over. So oh, it's no, five that's fine. now. So they have uh, now a virtual lab, and I think they will be quite happy if you continue with your presentation. If that's fine for you as well. Uh, just checking that the time uh, now it's over. But uh, the VM will be here, and everyone that wants to continue here, including you, of course, uh, with uh, in particular, I was asking you about these hierarchical groups. So I'm interested on that. Uh, uh -huh. Just saying that if someone has uh, other appointments, because there are people with different time zones that we have here, so they, they might have other things to do. Oh, sure. I completely uh, understand. But I, I'll, I'll keep. So are you OK? Continue? um yeah i mean the thing is this is the last example it's quite short so if you wanted me to just move to the lab tutorial i'd be happy yeah. to do that. Uh, that that that's that that's great so just uh go into your pace i will keep recording so if uh, anyone um for some for any reason that decides to leave we, we can check the recorded later as well i'm up, just uploading the records to the web page uh, now so just continue uh sadie thank you all right, perfect. Um, uh, okay, in that case, I will leave hierarchical groups uh, as an exercise. So that's there. And in that case, I've left in my notes. So it should be, I kind of talked through what, what I am um, executing and, and why. So hopefully it's quite self explanatory there. But feel free to, to throw me any questions on that one. Um, yes, yeah, so in this case, I'm going to go back to open my proper lab tutorial um, so we might cover some similar ground to the in the walkthrough but I've tried to show uh, different facets of, of things I've highlighted before um, um, so hopefully this should be showing further capability and um, some more, more breadth as well okay so here's our lab tutorial um this is just some information regarding i guess this is more for if people wanted to attempt the lab tutorial themselves um a bit of context i don't need to cover that now um so like with my walkthrough we've got kind of four different sections um where i'm trying to highlight various different things um and you know not focus too much on one um element of of the tool set um so like in my walkthrough, let's just first of all set up our notebook um, just to make the plots nice and large and um, get some some warnings about certain things that uh, we don't really care about. Um, and OK, so we're going to import our modules. Uh, in this case, I'm not going to import CFDM because, um, as, as I mentioned, CF Python um, extends it. So CF Python um, has all the capability of CFDM uh, and a lot more. So if we just work with CFDM, uh, sorry, with CF here, we can uh, not have to worry about, um, you know, which library we're using and whatnot, because we've got everything there in CF. But if you do want something more lightweight, um, please consider using CFDM, because that's what it's designed for, really. 
Um, certainly if you want to subclass it and, and extend it yourself with another library, that'd be great. Um, okay, so I've, sh I've shown this in the walkthrough. Let me just run through again. Um, actually, that reminds me, I'm going to clear all output from this notebook because it's, um, yeah, so we can run through it afresh. Um, can I do those cells? Excellent. So um, in IPython, this exclamation mark, just as a reminder, that just shows a command to, to avoid me from having to, to flick into a, a terminal and and do that and faff about with that. Um, so you see, we've got all our sample dates set here. Uh, I'm going to look at some different ones this time, um, possibly some of the, the same ones again, but in a different um, with a different a different view. Um, so first section. Um, so this is looking at reading in data sets, but in our walkthrough, we read data sets one data set at a time. Um, so I'd like to just demonstrate here that actually with CF Python, you can read in um, a whole number of data sets um, from your file system and um, you can create a field list from them all at once. Um, so this is just a reminder of how we read in a single field. Um, and remember, I'm calling it a field list because it will always come out as a list, even if there's only a single field. Um, you just unpack it, then you have your field. So you can see it's, it's within a list, but it's just one field. You can unpack that. But really what I want to show you, like say, is actually you can um, read in and convert all your data sets to, to a field list at once. Um, so you can use um, command line like syntax. So here's just a, a wildcard character to say everything under NCAST data, um, which is a, a NetCDF file by, by extension. Um, I put that because I think as I showed in the walkthrough, there is a PP file in there, so we don't want that to um, to come in. Although there wouldn't be an issue actually, because CF Python can read in PP, but it's more just these, uh, this lab tutorial is focusing on NetCDF, so let's just say that. Um, okay, so let's read that in. Um, just thinking that's not showing. I think I have to execute that in its own cell. So let me just create a new cell on the sly. Um, did I not define that? Hmm. Oh. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, I think this is a CF units issue in the environment, which oh, that's a shame. Um, yeah, there's an issue of CF time where there was a couple of things that were um, effectively leading to bugs. Let me just show you what you should get if, if the environment's right for that one. Um, and it's a notebook, so I, I'm not, uh, you can tell I'm not lying because it has, well, I presume it has to have been executed at some point unless you can hack it in some way. Um, oh, that's the old notebook. Let me. Go on to our, our lab tutorial notebook. Yes, unfortunately, uh, yes, this is one I made earlier. <laughs> In the, not quite satisfying is actually executing the cell. But here's what you should get if you if you do that with without this uh, CF time environment issue. A specific release that um, had something in that um, yeah was causing a few bugs upstream. But you can see what you should get. Um, that's just you know a medium detail inspection. You should get this long list of various fields. Um, so that's taken in all of the NetCDF data you had in that directory, um, converted it all to field constructs, popped it all in a list for you there. Um, and I was going to show you that the type. Actually, I can continue doing this with. My, my loan fields. Let me just go back to my actual notebook. I think the, the one I had previously, which I'm sure looks like I just read in a single file. Yes, yeah, so just to show you the type of this is a CF Python um, type called a field list, which essentially just uh, it's a subclass of a, an inbuilt Python list uh, designed to, to hold fields. But um, to show that you can do anything really that you can do with a normal Python list um, with a fields list. Um, so I'm going to do some slicing and things. With this short list, it's only one item long. So slicing is a bit, you know, so it's, well, it won't really work. I can take 
a slice to give you zero, but that's not very interesting. So I'll just skip those. But um, stay with this fields list that we had um, as I executed it here with, with the, the without the CF time issue, uh, which which has now been fixed by the way. It'll, um, shouldn't see that unless there's a specific version of CF time going on. Again, again, my fault for not getting that uh, clarified. Uh, but you see, if you take take the um, index in the same way you would with a Python list, you can access individual fields. So minus one for, for the final item will give you this final field. Uh, that's a slice from um, fifth last to, to last, not, not inclusive of the last. You see you've got the previous four there. I'm just using negative indices so that I don't have to scroll the way up and say, oh, look, it's the one up there. Um, so hopefully you can see them all on screen. Um, yeah, just to kind of prove to you in a, in a very maybe a bit over the top Python way that um, you can do all the things you can do really with a Python list on a fields list um, is to actually call do, which uh, you may be familiar. If you call do on, on an object, it will show you all the various attributes and methods that you can call on that object. In this case, I'm using a list comprehension just to essentially um, filter out all these Python special methods, um, including dir itself, things like that, um, with, with the dund or double underscore and the trilling underscore, double underscore. Uh, so you see is append, concatenate, uh, extend, index, insert, pop, remove, reverse, various things that you might be familiar with, um, for Python lists. There's also these select, select by. Now these aren't Python inbuilt, these are um, CF Python methods for um, fields lists. So think of a fields list like a CF, uh, like a Python inbuilt, except designed to contain fields in a way where you can sort and filter the fields in, in a, uh, a way that allows you to make use of metadata constructs, um, you know, pick by, select by, netcdf variable, that kind of thing. So it, it adds a lot of uh, CF, netcdf related functionality to a list. Right, back to my actual uh, notepad, uh, notebook. Um, yeah, so um, one thing yeah, I was wanting to emphasize with this, maybe I did in the walkthrough as well, but there's lots of different levels of detail you can get with inspection and I was going to use um, kind of an analogy of, of working with, I guess this is, could apply to most data sets, really, not just, you know, NetCDF, CF, NetCDF, or even geoscience data. But when working with your data, it's, it's going to use the analogy of, of cooking a meal. You um, you could cook it all um, just in one go without, you know, tasting it or opening the pot lid to see what you've got. But really, it's best and it's, it's wisest to actually um, keep track of what you've got. Um, throughout your, your various steps. Um, so, you know, if you've added 10 times too much salt, you know about it sooner rather than later. Um, like with your data, you know, if you've got one step wrong in your workflow and you end up with garbage at the end, um, you know about it sooner rather than later. So on that vein, just to demonstrate, and I think in the walkthrough, I've already demonstrated there's different levels of detail you can inspect um, your metadata with. Um, so in this case, you can do just a one line um, representation. Now, oh, here it is again. Yes, so the most concise. Um, you can print to get a bit more detail, and you do a full dump to get all the detail, at least all the metadata detail. Um, but I don't think I mentioned uh, focus on the data. Um, um, uh, I'm just going to ignore that. And I'll run the, I'll run the net CPF, um, the, the NC dump, just to show you that what you're getting from a, a CF Python dump is the same. It's presented in a slightly different way, but it's you know it's the same information. Um, you see, you have CF conventions 1.6, that's up there as well. Um, but yeah, so focusing more on the data, if you want to inspect your data, there's more. Uh, the, sorry, there's also multiple levels of um, verbosity of detail you can go into. Um, so taking our, our same field that we were looking at the metadata of, um, you can just look at the data in 
the, a concise view where you're being told the number of points, um, number of dimensions, number of points. When you're showing it very truncated, you just get two values there just to get a feel for it. Um, you can also call array, call the array method. Now that gives you direct access to the NumPy array behind behind the data. Um, again, this is truncated, and I believe in NumPy there's ways to you can actually access the whole array. You don't you know you see everything that's in there if you wanted to, but I'll you know I'll delegate that to NumPy. I'm not giving a, a NumPy tutorial, but you can access the NumPy array and do whatever you want with it there as well. Um, just to, yeah, prove a point. I think got. Yeah, showing the type ND array, n dimensional array. Um, uh, I was going to run that. Again. Have I run that before? Ah, oh, no, that was different. That was showing the variable. Um, yes, yeah, so obviously with NC dump, you can get all the data as well. But this is more, um, I guess I'm trying to demonstrate that um, in CF Python, you can do very similar things and in a Pythonic way, which I certainly like. I'm a big fan of Python. Um, some people aren't, which is, is fair enough. But you know, use whatever tool set suits you. But if you do like Python, then um, yeah, hopefully I'm showcasing that this is uh, certainly with the fields list. It's Pythonic. It's designed to, to fit well with Python. Um, yeah, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself actually. Um, just there. So I'm gonna say, in terms of data arrays, you can check the whole data array. You can look through it um, for days and not. Have an idea really what it's what it's showing really uh, i think the best way to um to view what um what the data you have is and um that you know the trends the patterns is to, to actually plot. yeah just to highlight cf plot again so with our land field in this case because it's a let me just zoom back up a little yeah because it's already quite a simple field that has just two dimensions, and they're um, well by nature of having two dimensions. You, know, you can plot it on a on a two D plane there. Um, by nature, you just throw it into uh, by nature of its its size, throw it into a contour plot of CF plot. Uh, don't even need any options, and it'll come out with with a graph. And in this case, I mean, you kind of hinted at by the name land.nc. Um, so you can see it's just basically. Um, an array of, of what is land on Earth and what is not, you know, zero one kind of Boolean um, equivalents to, to the integers that got zero one for, for the array. Um, now, this plot in itself is a pretty, I'd say it's come out just as default, so we just thrown it in with no options, pretty ugly. But say if you did want to get a nice plot out, just to highlight some of the, the customization potential with a with CF plot. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not it's not an interesting plot because you know the fact that the land on Earth looks like this is, is quite well established by now. But if you did want to um, make it look nice, I'm going to try and highlight throughout this lab tutorial that there's lots of different ways you can do that. Um, so let me just show a very basic customization. So we've gone from that to you see there's there's a kind of bumps right. That's actually the labeling because. Um, what you essentially end up with um, in between the grid points is this whole, um, you go from zero to one almost infinitism, inf infinitism, uh, yeah, I think you know what I'm trying to say, yeah, I struggle with that, that word. Um, but yeah, so it's trying to basically plot uh, 10 lines in one, even though the array is only zeros or ones, because it's some of them in between grids, it kind of um, tries to, uh, move between them very quickly, if you see what I mean. So uh, in this case, we're specifying we only have two levels. Change the color plot a bit to look a bit nicer. Lines equals false is, is the key here. We're hiding those contour lines because we just, you know, the contour is just basically the edges here. So that's a, a basic way you can customize a very boring plot. I'll show some, hopefully, some more interesting customizations uh, shortly. Um, yeah, so I've, just, I've got this kind of take home message, loads of ways to inspect data and metadata. I haven't shown so much specific inspection. So if you wanted to see a specific thing, like if you want to know the units or the standard name, I think I, sh I showed that in the, the walkthrough, but there's so many options to inspect. You know, if you want to 
um, look at the dimension coordinates specific, specifically or the cell methods, you can just um, there's methods that you call for that, and the documentation should give a it gives a full API reference for for methods like that. Um, okay, quickly. Um, I just think maybe I should check in case there's any questions, but maybe if the, if if there's lots of questions and I'm I'm not ignoring them, I just can't see them. So put, someone give me a shout if there is. Um, otherwise, I'll just go on. Um, so. Next section, um, querying and conditional masking. So um, I'll start how I usually start by just reading in a fields list, taking a field just because we, we know that. Um, oh, and here is an example of me just uh, asking for a specific piece of metadata, namely the, the standard name of the units. So let's just see what we get here. Um, so, you, so you don't have to inspect the whole, the whole field and get everything. You can ask for specific things um, in many ways. In this case, we see that the field we have is air temperature, uh, Kelvin, quite natural unit for that. Um, um, now we know what it is. Yes, just rename it to something a bit more intuitive. Best to have nice descriptive variables there. Um, and that's just to inspect it there as well. So you see we've got a uh, lat long points uh, over you know, the time is a scala there um hybrid height but yeah so the main thing to introduce here is is queries so cf.query that's the i guess the the central object for queries it's essentially encapsulating a condition so a condition could be you know um uh, well, i guess go with the examples i've got here equals 100 less than 100 um, now these are numeric conditions but i think i'll show you further on in this notebook or at least in the in the full course the it doesn't have to be numeric conditions there's other conditions you can have um, uh, but this is just a way in cf python um, to say is something equal to 100 is something less than um, strictly less than uh, greater than or equal to and you can construct um, various queries Actually, this cf.eeq is a shorthand for this one. This is kind of the full name, but there's also these short, shorter versions. So I've put the alternative syntax. Um, let me just run those. They're not going to do anything on their own because we're just constructing them. Um, but yeah, so the real use of these comes in that you can apply them to, of course, you can apply them to kind of standard Python objects. But really, the, the interest comes when you're applying them to, to objects in C of Python. Um, so data or fields or some sort of constructs, data or metadata. Um, so if you use the evaluate method on one of these um, queries that we created, um, then you can evaluate the condition on that item. Um, so just to kind of go between the two to, to make it clear what they are. So in this case, we're saying you have the condition of um, is this equal to 100? We're evaluating it against 100. So naturally, we should get, you know, 100 is 100. So yes, so true. Oops, in Python. Um, is 100 less than 100? False. Um, but more interestingly, you can query this on actual um, you know, compound objects. So not just, you know, single number. So let's run this across this data array, CF data, which is the object CF Python uses to hold the data in, in arrays and, and metadata arrays. Um, so you can see that in that case, less than 100, um, only 50 is. Um, so that's an illustration of them. But really, um, I guess introducing those as a slight aside, what I really want to show is that um, kind of practical usage of them on the field. So if we think back to our field that we read in, this was temp field. Um, I'll just quickly scroll up to show. Um, yeah, so we read it in from NetCDF, took a field out. We, we saw it was a, an air temperature field, hence we renamed it slightly. Uh, we didn't really do much inspection on it. Um, so let's just have a look at we, what we got. And like I say, it's always good to, to see what you're working with and keep checking everything after various operations is, as you think. Um, so I'm doing a print to get some detail. I'm also doing a contour plot here. This is some more customization. Um, so set vars with no arguments, map set with no arguments, levs with no, these are all just resetting things that we might have set before. So just basically to ensure we're not 
maintaining customizations from previous uh, runs. I was setting a different color scale just to change things up a little bit. Um, so yeah, here's your field, um, air temperature and Kelvin, um, you know, on a lat-long grid, standard lat-long grid. Here's a plot. Um, yeah, so that's basically what we're working with. Um, the reason I wanted to, to check that is because I want to apply these queries to the data. So what you can actually do is you can say, um, you can conditionally say, um, take data that is, uh, that, that obeys some conditions. So like we say, you know, equals 100 you could do, or um, is greater than something. And in this case, um, looking at what we have here, it might be nice to look at some of, I guess, the extremes um, and maybe look at some uh, or, or particular extreme, you know, lowest or highest. So um, um, yeah, so we, might, so we might want to pull out some data and create some conditions as we had before but on this data. I think um, before doing that immediately, um, what I've got here is I personally don't really you know, I don't think in terms of Kelvin that might be very intuitive so I thought it'd be a good uh, point to demonstrate some small kind of data metadata conversion um, so in this case let's just convert to, to degrees Celsius um, and you can do that by just changing the units attribute on um, on the field directly to a CF units object so CF Python has units objects, and that's all managed under the hood by CF units, which is a very powerful library with all the units you can ever need, um, at least for, for geoscience. So let's run that. And um, oh, I've got a plot as well that's about to come. But what I've called here is, first of all, I've print the original data before we do the conversion. Then after we convert the, the units to degree C, then print the data again and also plot it. So you can see we've converted the units and the data has all been changed to the right units. It's all been done with our units conversion. Um, and when we plot it, again, you can see um, everything's been converted to the equivalent. So you've got, if I just try and scroll back up to you've got the same contour line pattern or maybe the lines have shifted slightly to accommodate different kind of, uh, you know, you want to put integers rather than as contour lines rather than, you know, but this is the same data, the units have been converted. Um, so yeah, now we're in a slightly more um, intuitive unit. At least this is probably you know, biased by my own uh, uh, sway on, on units, I guess, but we did a units conversion as a, as a demonstration. Um, so yeah, so let's get rid of some of the, Let's look at the extremes. So as a, as a condition to encapsulate that, let's ignore um, anything that's not obviously very, very cold air temperatures at the poles uh, or very hot near the equator. Um, and these are some conditions that could encapsulate that, just eyeballing what data we have. Um, so actually, as your condition here, we want to take the opposite of, we, of what we um, what we want, because what we're going to do is mask the data that we're not interested in, just as an example of something you can do. Um, scientifically, you masking might not make much sense, but we'll, we'll just mask it to, sh to show that that can be done, because there's definitely cases where masking can be useful. It's not the, the time or place to discuss them, but let's just let's just do the, the masking. Um, so we're taking non-extreme values, um, because that's what we're going to mask. We're going to mask what we're not interested in. So let's also mask the lowest temperatures. So anything below, you see, yeah, we've got a zero here, which kind of separates some cold temperatures from moderate. And then within, uh, I've got what, yeah, mi minus seven, 23. Yeah, you see it goes up to minus 50 here. So that's kind of what will pick out some of the non-extreme values, some of the lowest temperatures. So there's our um, queries in CF. Um, and then, this is how we apply them onto a field and how we say we want to mask them. So where is a method on a field that can apply a condition um, via a query? And then you can say what you want to change 
uh, anything that satisfies that condition too. So CF masked is, is a constant in Python to imply mask data point, but you could, this doesn't have to be a mask. This could be just a, you know, it could be a number. It could be, um, you know, to say change all those values to 10, but masked is a, you know, a demonstrating something a bit different. So let's change them to mask val uh, values. Let me just run that. Oh, I forgot to run that one, I think. Yeah, I forgot to run that cell. There we go. Um, excellent. So we now have fields that are the same as uh, the temperature field, except we've added a mask. Given them different names, again, you can do things in place, but just to keep track of the steps we've done, particularly for this tutorial, I'm going to give them separate variable names. Um, right, so let's plot, let's plot to see what we actually have. Um, is the best way to certainly when we've got a mask it becomes quite obvious when you plot um, so we should have two plots coming up I'll just zoom up so the first case is when as I call it field with mask non-extreme so this is the query I had where I was masking data that's kind of in between I think it was minus 7 and 23 maybe and you can see it's masked all the kind of non-equatorial poles type uh, extreme data. Um, you see the mask is just, there's nothing there. It's not even on the color scale. It's just no data. So it's not plotted in a sense. Um, I think in NumPy, mask data has a very special role. It's, you know, it's not, um, it's not even data. It's philosophically quite, uh, quite different. Um, and here we are with masking lowest temperatures. You can see the color scales changed accordingly a bit just because the with CF plot, the color scale, unless you tell it not to, is uh, adapts to, to what you have. Um, but it's the same data, it's just got a different mask. Um, and actually in the yeah, in the walkthrough someone asked about different projections and I think as part of my customization, yeah, here we go. I might have showed a different projection um, in a previous example on this this lab tutorial, but here we go. Here we're specifying the, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, the mole, mole wide projection, maybe that's how you say it. But yes, you see we've changed from, let me quickly scroll up from what we had, from this kind of, I believe this is the default cylindrical um, just, um, projection to um, a different projection. I'll show another one now actually, because what I'm going to say is, particularly in this second case where we've queried on. Uh, where we've used a conditional masking to mask these lowest data points. Um, a projection like this where the poles are just smothered out on, aren't very useful. And actually, if we want to see what's happening at the poles, there are specific projections we can use. Um, I think that the polar, uh, oh, have I got the name down here? The polar stereographic projection, that's the one. Uh, in CF plot, that's MP steer, and there's SP steer as well. Let's just show the um the south pole i think just because i'm noticing i notice the greenland's very cold which probably makes sense for, um for air temperature anyway in this case obviously um so yeah let's plot on this uh polar stereographic projection just to show a few more customization op options with uh with the cf plot uh what else am i doing in this yeah i'm hiding the lines again just giving it a title nothing too fancy um wait for that obviously plots take slightly longer to execute than standard cells uh, again these plots are a little bit small i might look into why that's happening it could be to do with the notebook but um so you can see and I'll try to quickly flick back to show but kind of indicate the same data here so look we're looking at the north see that greenland's master's lowest temperatures for this first one and then for the second one you've got um some non mass data on the pole. Um, you see the plot here. Um, yeah, you can see that more clearly. So that's just to demonstrate some some customization. Um, if you were, you know, if you wanted to put this in a, in a publication, you'd probably, you know, uh, you notice that there's quite a lot of overlap on the, the color bar there. So you can customize that further. I've not gone to, to town. I just want to show a few different, um, you know, some different potential for, for customization. Um, excellent. So next section, further statistical collapses. So I, in my walkthrough, I showed some basic collapsing uh, of data. Um, and I'll 
do a kind of recap of basic collapsing. Actually, you can do some really complicated collapses, particularly relating to, to climatological time, uh, which is a climate, climatology is a thing that I struggle to get my head around, but I'll try and uh, um, at least show the concepts in practice, even if I don't really understand them. So uh, let's read another one of our, our sample data sets. Um, Again, I'm getting a fields list initially, but I'm taking the first index to grab the first field in there. Uh, there might only be one, that's why I tend to go for zero. Just it's, There's always going to be one field. Um, and then printing just to, to see what we've got. Um, so yeah, we've got an air temperature field. Um, 120 time points. But yeah, inspect it yourself and look at the detail. But in this case, um, because we have three dimensions, which are non-singular, um, be good to do some collapsing to reduce the um, essentially the subset of the data we've got, so that we can do some plotting and um, you know, take some meaningful um, insight into into what we have. Um, okay, so just a quick recap on on simple collapses. Um, first of all, I just created this utility function basically just to avoid me writing out the mean is, the maximum is, blah, 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 each time. Um, so that's just standard Python. Uh, but maybe a good demonstration. You don't have to, if you're working with the um, CF Python, CF plot docs, just don't forget, you know, this is all just um, designed to just work seamlessly with normal Python to be as Pythonic as possible. So you can just do normal Python things along with all your um cf python specific stuff and maybe that's really obvious but in case it isn't just to, to emphasize that so there's a quick utility function now what i'm doing here is i'm taking um a subspace first of all just an example remember subspace is where you basically say i want a specific point that's already in the data whereas a collapse is where you're taking some sort of statistical um operation on, on the data. For example, you're taking a maximum, a minimum, um, you know, an extrema, an average, a range. I think I had my list up here somewhere. Ah, here it is. It's still here. Yeah. So in the documentation, there's a full table. Um, just as a demonstration, it's good to, to consult the documentation because there's so much that we haven't covered and so much capability here. But here's a basic collapse. I'll take the subspace as well, just as an example. But the collapse is what I'm really interested in because I'm going to show you some more complicated ones, hence the, the section title name. Um, so say you wanted to take, you wanted to collapse the time axis down um, via taking the maximum. Um, I'm just printing out the stats of what you end up with for the data on that field. Um, and I've just basically printed out the kind of the name of what you've got, but then it, um, a report of the stats you've got. So for a subspace, well, I've just taken essentially a sample of the data. We have this, uh, but I've taken a temporal uh, uh, maximum and minimum. And you can see that actually over the, um, in terms of the time, the maximum, um, is giving generally higher values for air temperature than the minimum temperature, that's sorry, the minimum time. And then this subspace sample that we took is kind of in the middle, um, which if you think about the nature of, of collapsing, all, all makes sense. Um, and, the, and the nature of, um, well, uh, basic kind of expectations of, of climate and weather. Um, um, yeah, so moving on, probably slightly running out of time, so I try and be quick to show multiple collapses. So before we were doing just a single collapse, say that, but actually you can you can run multiple collapses. Um, you can do that by calling um, collapses on the intermediate fields. So you do one collapse and then call collapse on that field again. Um, if that makes sense, essentially chaining these collapses. Uh, but also you can do that in one go with some equivalent syntax where you are um doing it all in one go i think one thing i want to highlight um and i'm showing this via as i introduced in the walkthrough um testing equality on fields 
Um, so let me run this one. I've taken, um, yeah, these are equivalent syn syntax syntheses. So that's a plural. I don't think it's, it's done like it is. Um, but just to show that a equals b. So these fields are equivalent. So the syntax is equivalent. It's done the same thing at least. Um, so just to indicate that. And there's the, the date you've ended up with. Um, I guess one point of note is the units have changed. They were Kelvin. I'll not scroll up, but uh, what you see from these kind of collapses indicates so. I'll not scroll all the way up, but the units were Kelvin. They're now Kelvin squared, and that's because we've taken a sum of squares. So again, CF Python under the hood is managing the units. Um, but just to show, so if you do the same thing, the same collapses, but in a different order. So you chain them in the opposite way, um, or in the case of the equivalent syntax, you um, apply them the opposite way, way round. So instead of area, sorry, area mean there, you have area mean there last um, in the kind of space delimited order, you actually end up with, with something different. Uh, let's just run that. Uh, oh, did I not show it's different? So it's different, I guess, uh, explicitly by uh, non explicitly, implicitly by showing the, the data. You see, it's not the same value. And for certain operations, you might end up with the same thing. So it might be kind of commutative, but um, not generally. So you see, in this case, it isn't. So be careful in the order you apply your collapses uh, when you're doing multiple ones. Um, but we still have changed units because we have formed that sum of squares along the way. Uh, excellent. So group collapses, see multiple ones. Now groups are where you specify a group. And what happens is instead of collapsing uh, one axis to size one, um, you're creating a partition of, of size one axes that get collapsed. Um, so maybe that, maybe I made that more clear with an example. Um, so starting edge, yeah, like I say, just try to show some of the customizations options of CF plot uh, along the way. So just performing a change of projection, change of color scale, uh, just to you know, have a bit of, bit of fun with it there. Um, but the main point here is we're doing a group collapse. So same collapse method, um, collapsing over the x-axis here. We're going to do a mean for the statistical collapse. Um, but in this case, we're supplying a group. Um, this one will give um, so a zonal mean. Uh, and hopefully that will be more clear when I run this, just to, to plot the data. Uh, notice I've taken a subspace here. Uh, oh, let me go up. I've taken a subspace here just because um, um, by the time show this actually by the time you get the zonal mean still um, to be able to plot a sensible 2d plot you still need to reduce your data down because you still have um, so you still have um, multiple longitude points um, even if it's only two you still have them so you still have to take a subspace um, and you can see we took a group over um, uh, over the position uh, in degrees of the data. Um, so you're actually getting the yeah, that's half of the um, it's not one of the hemispheres it's half and half somehow. But um, you're taking a zonal mean over that um, that group such that um, you're collapsing it down um, to those two um, to those two elements instead of just straight down to one um, okay and finally the most I guess complicated at least in my at least as far as I understand it, um, like I say, climatology is, I find quite weird, but uh, collapses on climatological time. Now, these um, are multiple collapses. You need to do at least two, I think, two or three. Um, and there's some special um, 
qualifier that you use, which will demonstrate. Um, the documentation is quite detailed on this, uh, but I'll show you an example just as um, for, for any climate climatology uh, experts that understand what happens here. Um, so some more query objects. Uh, I think I mentioned before. This you know they don't have to be numeric queries. Some more query objects in CF Python are to do with um, date times. So this one. CF seasons will take um, the four sets of seasons. We can have them named explicitly. So M, A, M is March, April, May. I'm just giving these more intuitive variable names to try and um, help you to, to digest this code block here. Um, um, and here's the collapse itself. So notice we've got two space delimited collapses. So it is a multiple collapse. There's two, two of them. Um, we're using that alternative syntax where we're doing it instead of chaining them, we're just doing it all in one. Um, um, but this, because we're using these qualifiers, this within years or over years, you can also do within days, over days, a uh, mixture of, of the two. Um, this is a considered a climatological collapse. Um, so let's, let me just run that and try and... Uh, um, demonstrate. Oh, hello. Oh, is that just an, just an echo? Oh, I heard an echo. Maybe I'll, I'll go over. Um, yeah, so I'm plotting these two fields. What we're doing, uh, we've taken the climatological collapse, um, but then I'm taking a subspace over a query on either of these two seasons. So March, April, May, September, October, November. Obviously, there's two more you, you could explore. Uh, but I've just gone for two that are slightly different um, times of the year, um, you know, more spaced out. Um, so a subspace on each of those of the climatological collapse. Um, so you end up with, um, I believe it's called a multi-annual average of seasonal means, um, which uh, is, is a climatology. I am told, and you get different data. I mean, uh, I've printed them out so you can kind of ex in inspect uh, if you want to. Really, the plot, I, I think, demonstrates. This is another plot where I'm taking the difference. So I want to see the difference between two fields. Um, so you just use uh, field arithmetic and just t take them away. Um, and in this case, you see the difference on these uh, multi-annual average of seasonal means um, there's only slight temperature differences, you know, there's not, um, you know, relative to, you know, the, the um, air temperatures we see, it's not a huge variance, but um, it is um, across the, you know, the seasons, they are different, uh, quite interesting, part of this, uh, isn't it, because there's, uh, you see, uh, it tends to be negative in the um, uh, northern hemisphere, and then a uh, positive uh, difference in the the southern hemisphere. Uh, there will definitely be some um, scientific uh, you know, physics reason for that, um, but probably not my my uh, uh, job to not job, not the scope of this tutorial to to detail that one. Um, uh,